the designation of the United States since becoming president. And in this, for this visit, I have had the privilege to speak about my vision for the Philippines and the world through the platforms provided by the Asia Society in New York, the CSIS in Washington, and now here in the APCSS, here in the Aloha State. My message has always been firm, simple, and clear. The Philippines will continue to be an engaged and responsible neighbor and partner. Always finding ways to collaborate with the end goal of mutually beneficial outcomes, namely peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. It is through working together, guided by the rules based on allow our countries and our peoples to prosper. That has been the raison d'etre for my foreign policy of peace. There are many challenges, however, in the roads towards that peaceful and prosperous future that we envision. Another nuclear and space arms race are hovering over us. We are caught between the dual challenge of uh, the dual challenge of by advanced and emergency, emerging technologies, chief of which, of course, is uh, AI. Smaller countries like the Philippines are grappling with the need to enhance our security capabilities alongside allies and partners with larger regional players. So allow me this afternoon to speak more specifically about the two challenges that I believe are the most crucial to our common aspirations now. Number one is securing the in the West Philippine Sea. The Indo-Pacific region, particularly the West Philippine Sea, is in the middle of a global geopolitical transformation and has become an arena of normative contestation. Tensions in the West Philippine Sea are growing with persistent and lawful threats and challenges against Philippine sovereign rights and jurisdiction over our exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. Actions that violate obligations under international law, particularly the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, and the 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea. Our regular routine and resupply missions at Ayungin Shoal are subjected to coercive tactics and dangerous maneuvers of Coast Guard and maritime militia vessels in the West Philippine Sea, putting the lives of our people at risk and challenging the rule of law in that, that has defined our baselines, our economic zone, and uh, the maritime territory of the Philippines. There is rampant, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and militarization of reclaimed features in the South China Sea. There have been recent missions to Escoda and Rom Romulo Reef, revealed a which revealed a direct correlation between the presence of maritime militia vessels and reef damage in those features. If only for that, the impact of bio on biodiversity and the environment are, are, I'm afraid, are assessed as possibly already irreversible. This imperils livelihoods, this imperils the future generations of Filipinos. So I have said it before, and I will say it again. The Philippines will not give a single square inch of our territory to any foreign power. The law is clear, as defined by the UNCLOS, and the final and binding 2016 award on the South China Sea arbitration. Supported by the rules-based international order and our growing partnerships, both time-tested and new ones, we will insist on the preservation of the sovereignty and integrity of the country while working closely with international partners in the bilateral, regional, and multilateral settings in developing rules and processes to address these challenges. We appreciate certainly the concrete manifestations of the U.S. and the growing number of our other partners in support for the Philippine position. The strong factual messaging in support of our lawful exercise of our rights under international law and which will call out recent incidents in our EEZ. It demonstrates the strength of our alliance and partnership and challenges attempts to, to perpetuate false narratives. 
that has become a very important front in all of these uh, events that are happening in, uh, around the, in and around the Philippines. But un unfortunately, rhetoric is not enough. We need to upgrade our defense and civilian law enforcement capabilities, not only to defend ourselves, but also to enable us to become a reliable partner in promoting and guaranteeing regional security. That will require greater substantial infusions in the funding streams needed for our armed forces and Coast Guard modernization plans, including lines of effort to enhance cyber cooperation. I am optimistic from our recent engagement with our American counterparts, including U.S. legislature and certainly in the executive department, to elevate our partnership and dedicate resources to match our commitments. Over the past week, our teams have been working on a bilateral planning and tracking mechanism that is expected to accelerate concrete and substantial capability development investments and activities in order to meet our shared defense and security objectives over the next five years. Our defense secretaries also just met in Jakarta on the sidelines of the ASEAN Defense Group Meeting Plus to discuss efforts to further strengthen our lives. securing strategic sectors and critical infrastructure and especially as uh, we have all begun to recognize the importance of activities in cyberspace. All their notions of security and that now will include economic security. We welcome public-private partnerships, particularly engagements between and outside our military. For example, the Aguila Subic Shipyard Project supports Philippine efforts to position Subic Bay as a logistics hub and complement and initiatives. USAID development projects can also be harnessed to help boost our economic resilience. Expand these partnerships in critical strategic sectors and infrastructure. Just the other day, I witnessed on the sidelines of the APEC summit in San Francisco the signing of the Philippines United States Agreement for Cooperation Concerning Peaceful Uses of Nuclear Energy, or what is more commonly known as a This opens the doors for U.S. companies to invest and to participate in nuclear power projects in the Philippines. This is expected to boost national efforts towards securing an affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy supply. Our cooperation on cyber security is also a priority. national security. Critical infrastructure, whether with respect to ports, to energy, telecommunications, they will require cyber security measures to be in place for the country to be resilient. These systems form the backbone of our military, our hospital systems, our agricultural manufacturing, services sector. We launched the 2023 to 2032 National Innovation Agenda and Strategy document. This is the Philippine government's and establish a dynamic ecosystem in critical areas. Learning and education, for example, health, food, agribusiness, manufacturing and trade, transportation and logistics, public administration, security and defense, energy, blue economy, and water supply. We anticipate many areas where the U.S. as a leader in innovation and emerging technology can also be our major partner. Our teams are looking to convene the inaugural interagency PHUS Cyber Dialogue sometime early next year to follow through on our commitment to enhance cooperation in the face of new and emerging threats, including completely completing a full assessment of the cyber threat landscape and the establishment of next steps to counter cyber threats. 
So friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these challenges will continue to, in, to evolve. But I am confident that together we will be able to manage them. Our alliance is stronger than ever because it has been founded on our shared values, our mutual respect and trust of each other as equal sovereign partners and the unbreakable bonds between our two peoples. Our recent engagements across branches and levels of government confirm that we are committed to this relationship for the long term. At the same time, our growing network of partners, including Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the UK, European Union, will serve as force multipliers, which will help us bring, bring our country closer to the vision of a peaceful, secure, and prosperous nation within a secure and prosperous region. So I hope to continue this dialogue with all of you as we make our way on this principal path that we have chosen. We today are defining the future, the future for ourselves in our lifetime, but also for the generations to come. Thank you very much. Mahalo, Nuilo. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those incredible insights and perspectives and your vision for the future and how we can collaborate to make it a more secure and stable and prosperous region. Uh, before I start with some questions, and I'll tell you how the questions got synthesized, but I couldn't help, uh, yesterday your team came in here and started to put all these little artifacts. I know some of the folks in the back can't see it, but uh, Your Excellency, can you explain any of these artifacts that are up here? These are jeepneys. <laughs> Uh, about uh, if you don't know what a jeepney is, uh, these are these are uh, the transport the, the the jeeps that were left behind by the Americans after the war, which were converted into transport uh, transport systems, and they comprise a very large percentage of our transportation system. And the reason that we are highlighting them is because we are in the midst of an effort to go fully electric when it comes to public transport. Uh, this is our continuing effort uh, as a response, of course, to climate change to um, improve uh, the, uh, the mix of energy consumption and supply uh, from uh, the traditional fossil fuels uh, to more renewables. We have uh, uh, been uh, uh, reasonably successful. We are presently approaching 30% in terms of the energy mix, 30% renewable in terms of the energy mix uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the country's energy supply. And uh, that is why we put them out here to remind all that despite their very traditional look, they are being heavily modernized. Yes, sir. And, and I just came from the Philippines, and I have to tell you that, yeah, these are definitely still there. And, and people are using it. So, well, thank you for that, really. And for the audience, what we have done for purposes of time is we have many folks that we've invited to, to present us with a question, and our team synthesized it. And just with the constraint of the time that we have, I understand it, so I'll try to ask as much as I can before we have to, to terminate. I shall, I, I shall try to be brief. Yes, sir, thank you. <laughs> your Excellency, your comment about the critical challenges that we face out there was pretty, uh, was pretty vivid in terms of what we all face. But you also talked about opportunities and how you seek to resolve uh, disagreements through peaceful means. Mm. So I, I was wondering if you can elaborate on this relationship. I understand you met with the Admiral Aquilino and his team today and during your time here. Perhaps share with the audience some of those initiatives that you're looking at with the United States regarding promoting that better cooperation and collaboration in the future? Well, the, the, the basic idea, of course, of all of this is that the, the United States is our, um, I would say, our oldest uh, and most traditional partner uh, in, um, that, has been, that has been in various forms uh, ongoing for over a hundred years. And uh, I think it, uh, it is, uh, serves as well to remember 
that the United States is the Philippines' only treaty partner. And that is why that with the increasing heighten, the, the heightening tension in the West Philippine Sea, as we have named it, uh, because uh, uh, it is generally known as the South China Sea, uh, the increasing tensions in the South China Sea uh, require that we partner with the, our, our allies and our friends around the world uh, so as to be able to uh, come to some kind of resolution and to maintain the peace. And as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, really what the, uh, it's the, the, uh, the foreign policy of the, of the Philippines is really rather simple. And it really comes down to two things. Number one, peace. And number two, the national interest. And in, in that sense, we, have, uh, we no longer subscribe to the old uh, thinking, whereas, wherein it is a bipolar world and uh, each of the countries will choose whether to be with the Soviet Union or to be with the United States. I do not think it is not, in my view, this is no longer applicable, uh, no longer relevant to the way the state of affairs as they have evolved uh, geopolitically. So it is important that uh, we continue to strengthen that partnership. And the main partner is of, co of the Philippines is, of course, the United States. But starting with that, uh, we also feel that it is the, the way forward is to strengthen our partnerships in all, uh, with, with all our neighbors and with all our friendly, with all friendly nations who share our ideals, who share our aspirations, who share our values and the respect for the international rule of law. And this has been something that we have tried to develop and uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, uh, have, have had some uh, a measure of success and we will continue to do this. But again, the bedrock of any of these partnerships is the partnership and the treaty arrangement that we have, the mutual defense treaty that we have with the United States. And in that regard, we are continuing to uh, increase our uh, capabilities so as to be able to answer the challenges that, uh, that we are facing uh, every, well now it's becoming more and more often, uh, every so often whenever there is a confrontation between outside forces and Philippine forces. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately, uh, as I have uh, said uh, to some of our partners, uh, unfortunately I cannot report that uh, the situation is improving. The situation has become more dire than it was before. The, uh, the nearest reefs uh, that uh, uh, the PLA has started to show interest in, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, slowly uh, using these atolls, these shoals, as a basis for building, uh, basis really is what, those, is what they are, are approaching, the, have, have come closer and closer to the Philippine coastline. And the nearest one is now around 60 nautical miles from the nearest Philippine coast. And this, uh, this is an evolving situation. Uh, if you will remember, the Spratly Islands was used by the American, uh, by the U.S. Navy as a, uh, um, as a bombing range for a very long time. And so the, the, there, was no, there was no question that this was part of the Philippines. Now they have fallen into the hands of a foreign power. And many of these features uh, that, are, that are in the West Philippine Sea are slowly uh, being turned into bases, really. Uh, the uh, 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 Admiral uh, Aquilino just showed me a uh, relief sort of uh, map, not, not, not map, but model uh, of one of them. And the, it is remarkable the extent, the ex how the extensive uh, construction and the level of uh, uh, commitment that has been made to those uh, military bases. And so it's not, uh, it, is, it is something that we, that in our view, uh, of course the United States once again is the bedrock, is uh, the foundation for all that. But the more allies we find to speak up uh, whenever 
such uh, incursions are, occur, such incidents or events occur, uh, then I think the stronger that voice will be. And so we, we have encouraged that uh, to a great deal. The United States, of course, has been there. Uh, and in every instance where we have had trouble, uh, the U.S. has always been behind us in terms of support, uh, not only in terms of rhetoric, but also in terms of support. Uh, and, but that also applies now to Australia, to South Korea. And we are now in the, uh, negotiating a lot of for example, with Vietnam, because we are still waiting for the code of and ASEAN, and the progress has been rather slow, certainly. And so we've taken the initiative to, to approach those other countries around ASEAN with whom we have existing territorial conflicts, Vietnam being one of them, Malaysia being another, and to, uh, to make our own code of, code of conduct, and hopefully this will, be, uh, uh, this will grow further and extend into the other ASEAN countries. And, at the very least, here as in Asia, Asia, other organizations, but also bilateral countries uh, that uh, around Asia, who we have, who we have that countries with, but uh, whom I think we can uh, uh, we can find a way to maintain the status quo and certainly. The most primordial concern to maintain the peace. Thank you, Mr. President. I hope to see you in your speech. I remember just a recent visit I had in the and speaking to not just General Brown, but your Secretary of Defense, General Brown, and the consistent message of your firm res uh, resolve to work things peacefully, but to work with the United States.
Trump's election. President Marcus Vipers in Hawaii is the last thought of his week-long trip to the United States. Following his defense at the 30th Inter-Pacific Conference of the United States, the United States Congress has been in Washington, D.C.
as per my attendance of the APEC leaders meeting in San Francisco earlier this week. Well, I made sure, as I said, I made sure that we come to Hawaii so that I could spend a little time reminiscing with all our friends here and perhaps uh, go around and look at the places where uh, we used to spend time in the time that we were here. And uh, many of you, as, uh, as, uh, as um, we have all noted, many of you are also from uh, uh, before Han started this uh, all from the work, mga Ilocano. in the Philippines. Pinapanood namin ang lahat ang nangyayari sa Maui at uh, kawawa naman ang ating mga, mga Pilipino na naging casualty. And so, before I proceed, let us uh, share a moment of silence with, as we remember those who perished in the devastating wildfires in Maui last August. We pray for strength and courage to, for the relatives and friends of those fatalities as well as those who are still recovering and rebuilding their lives in the aftermath of that terrible disaster. I uh, truly appreciate seeing the celebrate the close connection that the Philippines has with Hawaii. I write Lisa and I bring the fond greetings of our family and the Filipino platform. For over a century now, the Filipino presence here has become part and parcel of Hawaiian culture. From the various industries, tourism, health, education, business and political representation, the Filipinos work can be seen and felt and indeed even tasted. I know that Filipino cuisine is a staple even in our non-Filipino friends and family now. And with 25% of the population of the state of Hawaii having roots in the Philippines, a rich and diverse culture has become deeply intertwined in the social fabric of the Aloha State. That, that is how deep the connection between us has been and will always be. Over the years, um, our Filipino Americans and Filipinos have contributed such a great deal to Hawaii's economic development. Our connection began when 15 Sakadas arrived in 1906 as plantation work. They left Salubagi Port in Ilocosur. Yun yung una. Kaya yung natin, nung 2006, we were able to celebrate the 100th year. At yung mga kamagana ng mga unang sumakay na immigrant workers, plantation workers dito sa Hawaii ay nakapag-celebrate kami kasama pa namin ang governor ng Hawaii At uh, dahil sa, hala, sa importansya na binibigay ng mga Hawaiano sa ating mga, sa, sa mga Pilipino ay uh, hanggang Pilipinas nagkakampanya na ang mga Amerikan na kandidato ay para makuha nila ang mga Pilipino. At uh, yan, ang, kami, yung, yan ang aming kinagawa nang nandito kami ni Manong Jo. At dino-organize uh, namin ang mga Pilipino uh, para naman eh, ma meron tayong boses sa uh, lahat ng mga nakikinig, lahat ng mga, mga leadership ng uh, Hawaii, ng Hanuman, at ng iba't ibang bayan sa uh, ibang lugar. Hindi ko yan si, I remember... Uh, to all of the governors and also the prime minister. You remember Mufi Hanuman was a um, was a for a while, and he was always saying that he's basically a Filipino, and that applies to not only the mayor but also all of the leadership. Na sila lahat naman sila ay pinalaki ng Filipino, kaya malapit sa puso nila ang Pilipinas. Subsequently, Filipinos shoulder to shoulder with American soldiers during the war. We see now many very successful second and third generation Filipinos, as well as present day migrants who are indelible, an indelible part of our society. Because of that, 
The Philippine enjoys a very special image in Hawaii. Thank you for all that you do for our country. And this is a characteristic that I have found. This is a characteristic that I have found everywhere that I go. And over the many years that Filipinos have been recognized. And not only in the United States, not only in Hawaii. Pero kahit saan ako pumunta, ay unang-una sinasabi ang gagaling ng Pilipino, ang sisipag, ang babait, mapagkatiwalaan, at uh, ang gagaling pa mag-Ingles, ang first na kami sa amin mag-Ingles. Kaya sana ako, kaya't naman, eh, kinikilala na ang Pilipino dahil sa inyo. It is because of your hard work, it is because of your talent, it is because of your, uh, your graciousness. And your affection for those that are around you. Ang pinaka ang pinaka ang lagi ang lagi na babanggit at tatangian ng Pilipino ay masadong matulungin at ipinapaliwanag ko sa kanila na mahal tayo kasama sa ugali ng Pilipino sa kultura ng Pilipino yung tinatawag na magiging bayanihan at hanggang sa lahat ng pinupuntahan ng Pilipino ay eh, eh, dala nila yan dala nila yan ng um, pagkabayanihan ng mga Pilipino at kahit na sinasabi nga nila kahit na hindi sa trabaho na ay eh, basta't may nangangailangan tumutulong pa rin kahit hindi Pilipino ang uh, nangangailangan ng tulong tutulungan ng mga Pinoy kaya taman mahal na mahal na kayo ng inyong mga kakilala dito, ang inyong mga katrabaho dito at hindi lamang uh, dito sa Hawaii kundi sa buong mundo ay kinikilala na ang Pilipino na dahil sa maganda ninyong ipinapakita at kami naman sa Pilipinas ay pinapalakpakan namin kayo kahit malayo at pinapalakpakan namin kayo sa inyong napakagandang ibinibigay at dinudulot sa reputasyon ng Pilipinas. I cannot go further without uh, giving another word of thanks. Alam nyo po, nung kampanya, nung last year, nung uh, 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 kami nahalal ni Inday Sara, ay hindi namin ma hindi kami nakapunta dito hindi kami makapagbiyahe gusto sana namin magkampanya kung saan-saan dahil sa dami ng Pilipino na sa abroad ay na naisana namin ngunit hindi namin ang hindi namin magawa dahil may covid pa noon at hindi masyado hindi pa lumilipad yung mga eroplano kaya hindi kami makapunta makapunta kahit saan doon lang kami sa Pilipinas muna and yet i am told that i garnered 83% of the votes in Hawaii and in America, Samoa during the voting exercise of last year. Kaya ay kailangan ko magpasalamat sa inyo sa inyong tiwala na ibinigay sa amin sa tiwala at suporta at pagmamahal na inyong pinaramdam sa amin. Kahit na hindi kami nakarating dito, ramdam na ramdam namin. Nakikita naman siguro ninyo yung uh, mga mga programa, mga rally natin dun sa, sa Facebook at nila live stream namin para nga makita ng lahat ng ating mga kababayan. Eh, hindi nga namin magawa kaya gumawa kami ng counting uh, replica noong kampanya para naman kayo na hindi namin napuntahan ay makaramdam kayo ng konti na aming karanasan nung nakarang halalan. Even from the time from my, from my father, you have been by our side in our quest to serve the country. From the bottom of my heart, I must say that I thank you for trusting me, for believing in, lead, in this leadership. In return, I and my administration will be hard at work and have been hard at work from day one to ensure that we accomplish all that we have set out to do. In San Francisco, I met with the leaders of other APEC countries where we discussed how to create a resilient and sustainable future for Filipino, Americans, and all the people of the APEC region by making our economies interconnected, innovative, and inclusive. And uh, I urge them to leverage APEC's core values, collaborate with the private sector, align efforts with global economic initiatives with a view to expand representation, strengthening government business relationships, addressing protectionism, intervening when the market fails while continuing to enhance cooperation on a broader scale. It has become a very important part of 
the transformation of the Philippine economy that uh, we are undertaking. And why is it that we have to transform the Philippine economy? Because COVID changed everything. COVID changed uh, the way we work. COVID changed the way we live. COVID changed the way we interact with one another. COVID changed the way we do business. And uh, we have to adjust accordingly. And the strength will come from these partnerships that we create with our friends and allies from around the world. You know, starting with APEC, with ASEAN, pati na sa UN, lahat yan ay talagang pinilalapitan natin. Uh, para naman, eh, pagka mas marami kayo na nagkakapit-bisig na nagtutulungan, mas matibay at mas mabilis at mas magiging matagumpay ang inyong mga ginagawa. So the Philippines' participation in this regional organization it promotes and helps us achieve our national objectives. So I am happy to share with you that the Philippines, the Philippine economy remains strong and positive. In 2022, our gross domestic product grew by 7.6% from 5.7% in 2021. And uh, in uh, the first half of 2020, our GDP grew by 5.3%, which if you compare it with many of our Asian neighbors, we are doing better than most of the world. Not only Asia, but we are doing better than most of the world. And I'm confident we will achieve our target growth of somewhere between five to six to six to six to seven percent, five to six percent uh, for this year. Because we have you and your full support with your trade missions, your various business pursuits. Our economic managers project our GDP to grow by uh, a very good number uh, from 2023 to 2028. Ang aming target po ay mula 2023 hanggang 2028 ay lumaki ang ekonomiya ng Pilipinas net-net about by 6.5 to 8.0 percent. We are closely monitoring domestic and external developments to make sure that whatever policy adjustments that are necessary are, in fact, being made. Employment and jobs in the Philippines are now at historic highs. Tourism growth areas are back in business. Investment, registration activities have significantly increased. Manufacturing activity has accelerated, contributing to the highest share of GDP at 18.7% is the contribution in 2022. We continue to closely monitor the impact of global economic slowdown and will facilitate diversification of external markets in order to expand opportunities for our exporters. We will still face many challenges in the economic sphere until next year and uh, in the following years. Hopefully they will subside, but nonetheless they will still be there. But you must, you must rest assured that we are better equipped now and more resilient now to withstand various external uh, uh, risks and challenges. With the active participation of all sectors of society, including overseas Filipinos, we can be on track in achieving social and economic transformation agenda towards a prosperous, inclusive, and resilient Philippines. There are so many things that we have to do. And that's why I cannot understand the need for us to be united. So I ask all of you, continue to be supportive of your government and of the Philippines. You have worked hard to build your lives here. You are the glue that holds us together. Let us keep traffic bustling between our two homes. Let us continue working together towards building a stronger Philippine Republic. I count on your support. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Babuhay ang Pilipino. Babuhay ang Pilipinas. Thank you very much. Mahalo. Philippine President Ferdinand R. Marcus Jr. Big one. Big one. Big one. Big one. Big one.
President R. Marcus Jr. has secured 672.3 million U.S. dollars in investment pledges from various sectors during his successful participation in the 30th Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC Economic Leaders Meeting and related activities in San Francisco, California last, last week. The investment pledges secured are 400 million U.S. dollars for the telecommunication sector, 250 million for semiconductor and electronics, 20 million dollars in pharmaceutical and healthcare, 2 million dollars for artificial, rather artificial intelligence or AI for weather forecasting, and 300 thousand U.S. dollars in renewable energy. President Marcos also secured significant commitments in technological advancements across key priority sectors in the Philippines, which include the deployment of the first two internet micro satellites dedicated to the Philippines. He also received technology-related commitments, particularly in the development of Asia's largest AI-driven weather forecasting program for the Philippines, bolstering the country's resilience against climate change through the agreement between the Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, and the U.S.-based company, ATMO. Also among the commitments concluded during President Marcus's APEC participation is the Philippines Inaugural Specialty Oncology Hospital that will enhance service efficiency and accessibility for Filipino patients seeking cancer care, which was a subject of an agreement between Ayala Corporation Health and the Veteran Medical Systems. The first you are FDA-approved manufacturing facility in the Philippines, which will bolster the country's global pharmaceutical industry presence through an agreement between Lloyd Laboratories and Bifgen was also secured. The agreement covering the first phase for a project on sustainable energy, which will provide affordable and reliable power access through the agreement between Miralco and UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation was also signed. An additional, rather, an additional investment of one billion U.S. dollars for the semiconductor industry is up for discussion with U.S. companies. The Philippines and the U.S. have also agreed to work towards strengthening the Philippines semiconductor supply chain. Philippine President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. on Sunday visited the United States Indo-Pacific Command, or indo in Honolulu, Hawaii. The President was met by Admiral John Aquilino, the 26th Commanding General of the indo Accompanying President Marcos were National Security Advisor Eduardo Anio, Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA Secretary Enrique Manolo, Philippine Ambassador to the U.S. Jose Ramirez, Armed Forces of the Philippines or AFP Chief Romeo Browner, House Speaker Martin Ramirez, and First Lady Luis Araneta Marcos. The indo Pacom houses over 380,000 employees, including soldiers, marines, airmen, guardians, coast guardsmen, and civilians from the Department of Defense. The command is in charge of all military activities of the United States in the Indo-Pacific region, including 36 countries, 14 time zones, and over 50% of the world population. Admiral Aquilino accompanied the Philippine president along with his delegation for a tour at Ford Island. On board a VIP barge, 
President Marcos and the Philippine delegation went to the USS Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor, where he laid a wreath at the memorial for 1,102 of the 1,177 sailors and marines died when Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japanese forces in December 7th, 1941. And finally, the Philippine fleet, or PF, acquired two more fast attack interdiction craft, or FAIC platforms, also known as the Asiara class gunboats from Israel. In a statement, PF spokesperson, Lieutenant Giovanni Badidas said, Robert Badidlas said, the gunboats were delivered Saturday through General Cargo Ship Cobra Royal and are now at the Commodore East Posadas Wharf in Cavite City for enhancement, maintenance, and training. The platforms will be commissioned as PG-906 and PG-907 under the Acero class patrol vessels of the fleet's littoral combat force. The delivery is part of the FOIC acquisition project of the Revised Armed Forces of the Philippines or RFP Modernization Program Horizon 2 contracted with Israel shipyards which includes a total of nine platforms and the transfer of technology to bolster the Philippine Navy or PS shipbuilding cap capability. With the delivery and pending commissioning of PG-906 and PG-907, the PN now has six Acero-class gunboats. The first two Acero-class gunboats, BRP Nestor Acero and BRP Leninato Toron, were delivered in September of 2022 and commissioned in November of the same year. The third and fourth FAICs, the BRP Hener Tinangag and BRP Domingo de Luana, were delivered in April and commissioned the following month. The remaining three Acero class gunboats are expected to be constructed and delivered within the next two years. Four of the FAICs will be armed with long line of sight missiles with gunpoint accuracy and a range of 25 kilometers, while the other five will be armed with Typhoon mounted 30 millimeter main cannons and 50 caliber heavy machine guns. The acquisition of the FAICs is among the 2019 projects approved by former President Rodrigo Duterte under the Horizon 2 list of the AFP Modernization Program. The notice of award for the FAICM project worth around 10 billion pesos was issued on January 1st, 2021. Before we conclude our program, we would like to invite everyone to come and visit our Facebook page at Radio Filipinas World Service. You will be able to hear and view our Filipino and English programs, including news updates here in the Philippines. Kindly subscribe, like, and share our posts as well. And that concludes this edition of Dateline Malacanang. For Radio Filipinas World Service, this is Leo Mampayo. Good day and stay safe.
Entertainment. The 15th Peanuts. Worldwide. From the integrated news team of the Presidential Broadcast Service, this is PBS News Now. or MMDA suspended the number coding scheme for Monday. The number coding has been lifted due to the passport strike, which will start on Monday, November 20. It might last until November 23. Ms. Stone said the strike is to express opposition against the looming public utility vehicle consolidation. Under the consolidation, GPs and UB Express need to consolidate into cooperatives or corporations before December 31. Says around 9,000 police personnel and 920 mobility assets will be deployed today for the transport strike. Transport vehicles will also be deployed at strategic points. Rocky One reports Agriculture Secretary Francisco Fuller Rose Warner different offices of his agency in Mindanao to hasten the assessment of farm structures damaged by the 6.8 earthquake on Friday. Secretary instructed them to look at the infrastructure damaged in Salangani and General Santo City, which were hardest hit by the earthquake. He also added to look into the needs of farmers and fishermen. For more on this and other news, tune in to RP1 738 Kilohertz. President Ferdinand R. Marcus Jr. is considering partnering with U.S. technology giant Starlink to strengthen internet connectivity in the Philippines. President Marcos Jr. said the Philippines may benefit from American technology, especially in the aspect of communication, digitalization, and connectivity. The president said he has instructed DICT Secretary John Ivan Uy to ensure the success of the project on top of having a satellite communications design for the country. The Department of Labor and Employment, or DOLA, reminded private sector employers to give the 13-month pay of their employees before December 24, 2023. DOLA Secretary Bienvenido Laguesma said this is in accordance with the Labor Code of the Philippines and Presidential Decree No. 851. Also, DOLA issued Labor Advisory No. 25 and No. 8 to serve as a guideline on the correct computation of benefits to workers. For more news, tune in to RP1 738 Kilohertz. From the news desk of RP1, this report was filed. A big-time onion smuggler has been arrested. According to Speaker Martin Hernandez, the arrest of Jason De Rojas Napulog in Batangas was due to the efforts of the police, thanks to the executive and legislature, in the fight against agricultural smuggling affecting the farmers and the buying public. Hernandez also assured the continued support of the House and President Ferdinand R. Marcus Jr.'s moves to improve security and resolving the anti-competitive practices. The Bureau of Immigration barred eight Filipinos from leaving for Malaysia at the Zamboanga International Seaport. There, they were intercepted by the immigration authorities, giving various alibis from purchasing welding equipment and visiting friends and relations. VI Commissioner Norman Pansinko said the threat of human trafficking is continuously being monitored at all Philippine ports. For more reports on developments, tune in to RP1738 kilohertz. Of Miss Universe 2023 is Shane Hayes Palacio from Nicaragua. Her country's first ever crown, earning her title at the 72nd Miss Universe pageant held in El Salvador. Shane Hayes is a trilingual model, television host, and community developer who previously finished the top 10 of Teen Universe 2017 and top 40 of Miss World 2021. Prior to Sheamus' win, Nicaragua had only placed at Miss Universe four times since joining in 1955. Happy Women Reports, PNG Chief Police General Benjamin Aporta Jr. reminds police to exercise maximum tolerance during the Pistol and Transport Strike. Police spokesperson, Police Colonel Gene Fajardo, says the chief told them to let the rallies have their say as long as it doesn't affect the rights of others. They also asked drivers on strike not to force those who don't want to join them. They're also helping out will provide free rides to stranded commuters. Fuel prices are down this week. Shell, fuel oil, Caltex, and clean fuel announced price cuts for tomorrow. Gasoline down 75 centavos per liter. Diesel 65 centavos. And kerosene by 60 centavos. In other parts of the world, France is prepping to send medical help to Gaza. AFP reports the office of the president say France is sending a helicopter carrier to the eastern Mediterranean to offer medical assistance. They're also planning to send a charter flight carrying more than 10 tons of medical 